So good morning, I'm Trent Magruder. I'm one of the cardiothoracic surgeons out at Piedmont Athens. I'm gonna talk a little bit about aortic valve disease today, and this will dovetail nicely with Dr. Cowden's talk. Unfortunately, I'm young and I have no disclosures, at least not yet. So we'll talk about anatomy, we'll talk about evidence and indications for surgery. We'll go over imaging briefly, and then I'll show you some pictures of operations I've done out in Athens at the end of this. So a quick anatomy lesson. So you've got your aortic root here. So this is gonna be your aortic valve, your sinuses of valsalva up to the sinus tubular junction. And then you've got your ascending aorta. So here's an elective aneurysm I recently did. And this patient had both an aortic root aneurysm. He was about 53, 54 millimeters of the sinuses of valsalva that are hiding down there. He had really effaced sinuses, no STJ definition. And he also had an ascending aorta that was around 55 millimeters. And that's what my Debakey forceps are pointing to there. So we recently had a new guideline from the ACC and the AHA come out at the end of last year addressing aortic disease. The official definitions now specify that an aorta of 40 or greater is gonna be called dilated, 45 or greater makes you an aneurysm, and they discourage the use of the term ectasia at this point. And what happens, here's the old slide from medical school, is the aorta gets in, of an increased diameter, the wall tension increases, and you can get a dissection or a hematoma if you have an identifiable tear in the intima or not. And then you can get compromise of the true lumen flow, and that's called malperfusion. You can get that in different ways. Obviously, if this happens in the root, like we're talking about aortic valve surgery today, if you get malperfusion of a coronary, or you can end up dead pretty quickly. If you, that dissects up into the arch, you have malperfusion to a brain vessel, you can stroke. And we think this is why maybe up to 50% of aortic dissections, or at least ascending aortic dissections die in the field, for example, Grant Wall at the World Cup recently. Because aortic dissection is such a catastrophe, the goal is to prevent it with prophylactic operations. So I'm gonna show a little bit of data here. The Yale group, so this is John Eleftariades and his group, wrote one of the first papers addressing this question and they found an inflection point for the risk of dissection or rupture around 55 millimeters and that was the basis for the old class one standalone indication. There's a lot of more recent, not a lot, but there's some more recent evidence that suggests that aortas, for example, that are 45 millimeters or greater, dissect at a much higher rate relative That's to normal I aortas of 34 or less. The Cleveland Clinic group has looked at this specifically for bicuspid valves, and they've looked at both the root, i.e. the sinuses of valsalva, and the ascending aorta. And you can see inflection points for the risk of dissection around the mid 50, 55 millimeter range. Um, they've also looked at this indexing the cross-sectional area of the circle or ellipse of the aorta relative to the patient's height. And you can see picking a cutoff of around 10 square centimeters of aortic uh, area per meter of height, that there's a significant survival difference here. And interestingly, this is true both in the root of the sinuses of Valsalva and at the ascending aorta. So the point here is that there is a size at which your risk goes up and that size, that risk rather starts to pick up around the 50 millimeter um, area. So based on those and other data I'm not gonna bore you with now, um, the traditional standalone indication to replace the root or the ascending aorta at 55 remains a class one indication. Rapid growth is also an indication. Uh, I would argue, and, and I think the guidelines are moving in this direction, that those two criteria may be overly conservative in younger and healthier patients. The morbidity and mortality of these elective operations is actually quite low. So the 2022 ACCA AHA guideline for the diagnosis and management of aortic disease now says that aortas of 50 millimeters or more may be replaced as a standalone class one indication if it's heritable, a genetic, or 2A even if it's sporadic. There actually is a recommendation if it's heritable and high risk to replace it at 45. But for the purposes of our talk today about the aortic valve, the 2A recommendation concomitant with aortic valve surgery is to replace it at 45 in experienced centers, and if it, even if it's tri-leaflet. The recommendation for concomitant with other cardiac surgery is 50, though I think a lot of us would be a little bit uncomfortable leaving a 48 or 49 millimeter aorta in a healthy patient if we're doing a cabbage or something at the same time. And I'm not, we don't have time to get into the syndromes today, but those decisions are gonna be a bit more individualized. So I'm gonna show you some newer metrics here. I, I, the idea here is that there, a growing body of evidence suggests basically that there may be more information contained in indexing the aorta to patient's size relative to the absolute size alone. So the Cleveland Clinic group has promoted the aortic cross-sectional area to height ratio, and that's a 2A indication in the RATIS guidelines. The Yale group has both an aortic height index, which has um, a class 2B indication. Now, one thing I would point out is that to meet that class 2B indication for a standalone aortic surgery, you're gonna be in the orange area of that nomogram. But if you look at this yellow area, According to the Yale retrospective data, which some people think overstates this risk, but maybe, maybe not, 
there's a lot of people with aneurysms who are going to fall into this yellow area. And I discuss that with all my patients so that they understand that the risk of waiting on something is not zero. Okay. This is the size index. This just makes the denominator body surface area instead of height. That also features in the guidelines. So to show you the tables from the guidelines, um, you've got your 55 millimeter standalone indication there. Here's your 2A 50 millimeter standalone indication. Here's your 45 millimeter concomitant indication. And notice that that's for a tricuspid valve. If you go over to the 2022 valve guidelines there, they only mention aortic aneurysms in the context of the bicuspid aortic valve section, but they also have a recommendation for 45. So now the aortic guidelines say whether you're bicuspid or tricuspid, you can work on it at 45. Um, and then the height and size index, these sort of standardized metrics now feature in the guidelines for the first time, which is exciting. I also just underline there, valve sparing surgery may be an option here. I know we're talking about aortic valve disease, but if your valve is in reasonable shape, we might be able to spare it. Um, a key, this is a sort of a key point about imaging. Um, be careful with this. I personally measure every CT scan and make a table in all my notes for every patient I follow. You have to measure this perpendicular to the axis of flow. Here's a, a patient I saw over the summer, got referred to me with a 47 millimeter root right here. I took about 30 seconds, flipped this around. It's not 47, it's 54, which explains why he had severe aortic insufficiency. And one of our community cardiologists had been following him thinking he was asymptomatic, which he really wasn't. Here's your anatomy here. This is the valve I took out of this guy. So you can see the free margins don't even come close to co-opting those free mar the valve leaflets are on bow strings. I did a uh, mechanical root and ascending hemi arch replacement and he did really well with that. A couple of pictures just to finish up here. So um, here's a picture of a recent root and ascending replacement I did. So this patient was about 60, I think he was 62 years old. He had a bicuspid valve with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. I put in a connect to root grafts. This is an Edwards product. It's an Edwards and Spiris tissue valve um, inside of a Valsalva graft. You can see the Valsalva graft has its own sinuses at the bottom. So there's a right coronary button, makes it a lot easier to put those on. And then I did an ascending and a hemi arch. If I'm going in there to replace aorta, if any, if up top, if it's 45 or bigger, I'm going to get rid of that as well. So the patient can't have a problem. Them. Here's another one. This is the guy I showed you the CT scan of a minute ago. So he got an onyx mechanical valve conduit. Nice thing about the onyx is they can go to a lower INR down the road. Unfortunately, ProAct 10A didn't work out, but they do well with an INR of 1.5 to 2. There's his hemi arch graft, and he did well with that. That's his valve. Um, to punchline, prevent aortic dissections. Don't have one. They're bad. This is a dissection that came into Athens last spring for me. Here's the RA, the RV. You can see the dissection. She was rupturing into her AP window right there. This is a mess to fix if you have a dissection. This lady actually had a retrograde type A. She had a tear at the subclavian then in the root. This was a mess because I had to do a root because her root was torn. Her valve was trashed. Had to do um, a total arch because her, her arch was falling apart and anti-grade T-var and then sew it all together. And we got her through that, but that's a mess and not something you want to do in an emergency if you don't absolutely have to. Again, on the theme of do prophylactic operations, don't have a dissection. This guy had a dissection in Athens in 2016 that got fixed. He had a big chronic arch dissection and severe AI. Did this redo about three weeks ago. You can see on Circares, there's his chronic dissection flap. Patients who have dissections do poorly. They have lots of reinterventions down the road. So it is much better to do a low risk elective operation than to let this happen. Um, takeaway points, aortic aneurysms are real and dangerous. They have a real risk of death, dissection, and rupture. The latest guidelines recommend a more aggressive approach that I think has sort of traditionally been advocated. The 50 millimeter standalone threshold at 45 concomitant with aortic valve replacement or repair. Again, inappropriate surgical candidates. You have to do some shared decision making here. And we had already alluded to this, so I won't berate the point, but it, in Athens, if we see a 65 year old who wants a TAVR and they have a 50 millimeter aorta, unless there's some reason we think they're a prohibitive operative candidate, they're going to surgery and they're getting at least part or all of their aorta replaced with the valve. Uh, don't forget screening at first degree relatives. These people who come in with aneurysms, up to 20% of family members may be uh, affected. Just an echo is fine as long as they can see at least the root and part of the ascending. And the surgical outcomes for this are excellent. The mortality is 2% or even less in elective patients. Our patients in Athens do really well with this. So don't be afraid of sending someone to surgery to prevent what could be a catastrophic problem down the road.